Next, we will have oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is uh, for the Premier. Over the last year, seniors in long-term care and the families that love them have been forced to endure horror after horror inside a broken long-term care system, largely controlled by for-profit corporations. At every turn, the Premier has promised, I'm holding these people accountable. Really? The Premier has promised that over and over again. I'm holding these people accountable, he has said. Yesterday, he actually exempted these for-profit chains, <laughs> chains from legal liability and also exempted himself. Families are looking for accountability and justice, and they are looking for accountability and justice, rightfully so. They deserve accountability and justice. So my question to the Premier is, why is his first instinct to ensure he won't be legally responsible? The Attorney General to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I welcome the chance to give some context and to clarify because I don't think that the member opposite has actually read the bill, Mr. Speaker, because what the bill does not do, the bill does not protect bad actors. The bill does not prohibit anything to do with failure to provide necessities of life or deliberate failure to, for standard of care or fraud or fraudulent misrepresentation or assault or battery or any number of things that are being alleged out there in the public sphere, Mr. Speaker. What the bill does do is protect those who, in good faith, are making best efforts to do their job. What we're talking about, Mr. Speaker, are the PSWs on the front line. We're talking about the paramedics. We're talking about the hockey coaches, the charities, the nonprofits, the volunteers. We are talking about the people who are contributing to our community and keeping our loved ones safe, Mr. Speaker. And we will let the bad actors pay their price. But we are protecting those who are acting in good faith. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, as a lawyer, the member opposite should know better. And it's shameful that he would suggest that they are Order not doing exactly side. what it is that they are doing. Order. Families who have lost loved ones in long-term care, who learned that Order. their mother or father choked to death from being force-fed or left in a bed with soiled diapers for days, in fact, for a week on end, it's not acceptable, Speaker. Those folks have turned to the courts, as we all know. They have turned to the courts to get answers, to get accountability, to get justice for their loved ones. So why is the Premier promising that they can get that justice, that accountability, but not delivering on that promise, Speaker? The Premier, instead, is changing the law to protect for-profit homes and himself by denying families the accountability. The, the Minister of Education, come to order. He's denying their Stop the clock. I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition for interrupting her. Minister of Education will come to order. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition, please your exactly question. When the government prevents people from getting their day in court, why is this Mr. F or the Premier's top priority? Order. Solicitor General, come to order. The Mr. Attorney General will reply. If, if, if the Leader of the Opposition doesn't like my legal opinion, she can perhaps talk to the Attorney General of BC, who brought in very similar legislation. The NDP government brought in very similar legislation, Mr. Speaker. Order. We, are, we are not protecting bad actors. Bad actors beware. Bad actors need to be on guard because they are still in breach and they are still in danger, Mr. Speaker. We are protecting the frontline workers. We are protecting the hockey coaches, the dance instructors, those who are putting themselves out there for our communities to make our places better to live in. And we are all doing this together, Mr. Speaker. This is the spirit of Ontario. We are hanging together, and we are going to make sure that we get through COVID as a team, Mr. Speaker. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I think it's shameful that the government's trying to shield their bad actions with uh, calling out folks like hockey coaches or sports coaches or PSWs. That Minister is Labor, absolutely shameful to try to shield themselves with these folks who do their best to make our communities great places. We know that several families have already filed statements of claim detailing horrific levels of neglect and carelessness against for-profit facilities. We know that these for-profit chains have been at 
actually frantically working the back rooms to protect their interests. We remember an executive at the for-profit chain Siena who mocked the concerns of families at Woodbridge, Care, uh, Woodbridge Vista Care and referred to their concerns as blood-sucking lawsuits. That's what has been said. And now we can see that these are the folks that the Premier is getting prepared to, to protect, to defend. Why is he rewriting Question. the law to protect himself and the for-profit chains that are making millions in profit and not ensuring justice for families? Why? The Attorney General's reply. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is doing a disservice to the frontline workers and the volunteers and the charities and the nonprofits in this province. What we are doing is making space in the system so those bad actors can be held to account. We do not want people who are doing their honest, best, and good faith to be put in harm's way when they're every day going into those facilities as PSW workers. They're going into their communities to do the work at food banks, through charities, through nonprofits. Mr. Speaker, the, the critic for health asked me to do this, Mr. Speaker. The member from Humber River, Black Creek, asked me to do this. I have several letters from the opposition and from, the, uh, and from Liberal members who have said, our communities need this kind of protection, Mr. Speaker, and we are delivering. I remind all members that uh, props are not to be used in the House during question period or any other time. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My, my next question is uh, also for the Premier, but I have to say what PSWs needed was more staff on the front lines of COVID-19. That's what they needed. Not a government that's protecting their for-profit uh, chains that are cutting their hours and keeping them in low-paid part-time work. That's what they needed. Associate Look, Minister last Energy, April, come to families order. of residents at Camilla Care filed a statement of claim, and we all know this, including sworn affidavits detailing residents not being cleaned after soiling themselves, being denied testing when exhibiting signs of COVID-19. One of the plaintiffs, Innes Imgram, which, which folks might remember, was so desperate that he actually chained himself to a tree to try to get the kind of resources and supports that his mother needed. And I have to say, sadly, he lost his mother about a week ago, so my condolences go out to Innes. But he believed that the, a lawsuit was the only way, the only way that Question. he could uh, get accountability, that people would be held to account a lawsuit. And now the Premier is changing the law to prevent Innes from getting the justice he deserves. Why? Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, if we want justice to be served, then justice has to be delivered. And the system has to be able to accommodate those hearings, Mr. Speaker. Yes, sorry, Mr. Speaker, I was watching for your cue. Um, we, we, we need to make sure that those people get their day in court for those bad actors, for those people who are doing things beyond and gross negligent level, Mr. Speaker. We need to make sure that there's room in the system so that those pieces can get hurt. Not the people who are doing the front lines who are putting themselves out there. Not the grocery clerks who, through through honest effort and, and an honest belief were doing the right things. They're taking public health advice. They were putting themselves out there. They're on the front lines, Mr. Speaker. Those people should not be put in jeopardy, nor should they gum up our system so that the bad actors can't get hurt. Well, Speaker, to have the Attorney General suggest that people attempting to get justice is gumming up our justice system is shameful. It's disgraceful. The bottom line is you can't change the law to try to deny people justice, or you shouldn't. That's not democratic. At Pickering's Orchard Villa, the Canadian Armed Forces found horrifying scenes of cockroaches and patients left in beds with soiled diapers. Sylvia Lyon decided to take Orchard Villa to court after her mother died. And this is what she said at the time. And the government should listen to this. My mother was a good, decent individual. We entrusted her care to the owners of Orchard Villa. They received over $11 million in funding each and every year from the government. Yet each year, the care provided was less and less. Those that are responsible for this state of affairs must be be held accountable. I agree with Sylvia. Sylvia. So why is the Premier changing the law to protect Orchard Villa when he failed to protect Sylvia and failed to protect her mother? Remind members to make their comments through the chair. Attorney General, to reply. Mr. Speaker, the question that the Leader of the Opposition needs to ask herself is very simple. Were those people following public health advice? Were they taking the advice? Were they implementing the advice? Were they doing it in good faith? Were they making an honest effort? Were all those things true? Were the people working in that system, should the PSWs, should the, the health care workers, should the, the grocery store clerks, should the hockey coaches who are putting themselves out there, the, the dance instructors who are working with our kids so that they can 
get physical exercise so that there's mental health components. This feeds all the way through, Mr. Speaker. Should those people who are making an honest effort in good faith be thrown into harm's way? Leader of the opposition. Well, Sarah, I would submit to the member opposite that those are questions for the courts to decide. That's those right. are questions for the courts to decide, not for the government to protect right. its own friends and for profit come to corporations. Order. That's what's happening here. Families have heard hollow promises from this Premier over and over again. Yet at every stage, even while the Premier talked about change, he has been working with connected Conservative lobbyists in the back rooms to ensure that for profit companies making millions in long-term care uh, making millions from long-term care I should say will be protected and that there will be no accountability for residents and their families why is the premier rewriting the law to protect for-profit corporations making millions in profits and not the seniors who lost their lives in long-term care and not their Question. family members that have experienced such horrors over this last several months the Attorney General Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We finally found common ground. I totally agree. These are issues the court should decide. But to stand here and prejudge is a little sanctimonious, Mr. Speaker. The opposition come to order. Mr. Speaker, it is exactly for the courts to decide. It is for the courts to decide if people were acting with honest belief. If they, if it for was the opposition good come faith, to order. If they were doing everything they thought they could do. If they took public health advice, they implemented public health advice, they put themselves out there in their communities, should they have a level of protection? Yes, the courts should decide that. And Mr. Speaker, to stand here and rhyme off case after case after case without really having much depth of what people did or tried to do or where they took their public health advice is a little bit rich, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. My colleagues and I have had the honour of working with Kathy Parks, a daughter who tragically lost her father, Paul, to the devastating COVID outbreak at the Orchard Villa long-term care home in Pickering earlier this year. Upon hearing the news of this government's decision to protect the very people who put her father's life in jeopardy, Kathy told us this, quote, My family and others like us have been through a living hell in the past six months. We watched our loved ones suffer and die while our hands were tied and the only people who could help didn't move fast enough. This tragedy will be etched in history as a time when those in power failed to protect our vulnerable citizens, and this new step shows the corruption of power at its absolute worst." End quote. What does the government have to say to Kathy and her family? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I do want to start by saying that we acknowledge that there, there are tragic circumstances, and people are struggling through COVID-19. They absolutely are. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that we are doing everything possible as a government to help our communities through this period. And I, I was quickly checking my, my various letters from the opposition asking me to bring in this legislation. Uh, I don't see one from the member who asked the question, uh, but several of her colleagues have expressed concern for people in their communities who want to contribute to the communities, who want to come forward and want to feel security that if they make an honest effort and they do it in good faith and they get public health advice and they implement that advice, that they have a level of protection that they can engage in their communities and that we can, Mr. Speaker, reach out and, and help in every way possible. Mr. Speaker, there are tragedies, and my heart goes out to them. Response? Mr. Speaker, we, we need to make sure that we're putting our resources where they can help the most, Mr. Speaker. In the supplementary. Again, to the Premier, and I will submit that I have been standing alongside the families, as all of my colleagues have, in our communities, demanding justice and trying to get them the support that they need during this difficult time. And across Ontario, those families who have lost loved ones to COVID in long-term care are seeking justice. We have heard countless reports from families, residents, PSWs, and even the armed forces, who all detail the horrific conditions that allowed this outbreak to claim over 1,900 lives in the first wave. First, this government hid from accountability by refusing an independent public judicial inquiry. Now they're making laws to evade responsibility and duck liability. Speaker, private for-profit homes like Southbridge's Orchard Villa Long-Term Care, with a long record of orders, complaints and non-compliance, should not be allowed to operate with impunity. Why is the government trying to stand in the way of Ontarians like Kathy from holding these homes accountable? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're, we're doing exactly that. We're, we're making the system 
so that those who are the bad actors, those who are, are part of failure to provide necessities of life, those, those individuals or companies or nonprofits or, or any group who is, is not acting in good faith and is not providing a level of service that is appropriate, Mr. Speaker, they are in harm's way, and we will let them stay in harm's way. But who we will not let go into harm's way are our volunteers and our communities and our frontline workers who are acting with an honest belief and acting in good faith and taking public health advice and implementing that advice, Mr. Speaker. We will not throw them in front of the bus, Mr. Speaker. It is important that we protect our communities and those who, who contribute to our communities, and that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. Next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today, I would like to direct my question to the government house leader. You know, when I woke up this morning, I turned the TV on and normally watch the six o'clock news, and sure enough, I was rather shocked, of course, in one way. And uh, when we learned that there is going to be a confidence vote this afternoon in the federal legislature that could plunge this country really into a general election. Yet two weeks ago, the Ontario Liberal leader, Stephen Del Duca, said that calling a snap election in the middle of a course of a pandemic would be bad for the people of Ontario. Well, we agreed then, we agreed now, absolutely. But Mr. Speaker, Ontario, as we all know, we're involved in a number of joint initiatives and ventures with the federal government, including support for small businesses and families. So with the government house leader now, Please indicate how a federal election would impact the ongoing partnership we have between the federal government and the provincial government, and if these pandemic uh, supports that we have right now could be adversely affected. I recognize the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member uh, for uh, for that question. It's a very, very important question. Obviously, uh, as the member uh, noted uh, today, uh, the federal house is uh, going to be seized with a confidence motion that could plunge the uh, uh, the country into an election. He's quite correct. There are a number of initiatives that we are working on together that uh, a uh, election would obviously put a, a pause on, Mr. Speaker. So I do encourage my friends at the federal level, all parties, to work together the way this house has been working together for months, Mr. Speaker. In fact. Uh, uh, just two weeks ago, uh, the, the leader of the Liberal Party, Mr. Stephen Del Duca, took the unprecedented step of bringing forward Ontario and Canada's first ever motion of confidence in a government, Mr. Speaker, which I'm proud to say uh, passed unanimously. All members of this le legislature, the official opposition, the, the, uh, uh, the Liberals, all voted in favour of this government continuing to do the good work that it has done over the last two years, Mr. Speaker. So I would hope that my friends at the federal level would uh, take, our, uh, take the, uh, their lead from us, uh, Mr. Speaker, so that we continue working together for the benefit of all Ontarians. A supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, given the critical importance that uh, an election poses to all these joint support programs that, uh, that we're able to participate in in order to help and guide the people of Ontario in this country out of this dastardly pandemic circumstance. A cooperation is absolutely needed. But of course, should we have an election, many, many things then fall by the wayside. I wonder if the, the, uh, the government house leader could expand upon some of the possible impacts of this, of this federal election, should it be called. Uh, uh, again, thank, uh, thank the honourable member. Of course, Mr. Speaker, uh, across various ministries in, in the government, there are a, a number of initiatives that we are working together on, whether it's the Minister of Education, who has been working uh, uh, to uh, protect students, the Minister of Finance, who has been working very closely with his counterpart in, uh, in Ottawa to ensure that protections for uh, small businesses are uh, are expanded with the Minister of Health, the Minister of Long-Term Care. So across government, there are a number of initiatives that we have been working on together, Mr. Speaker, that would all be put in jeopardy if an election was held today. The member is quite right. A week ago, the leader of the Liberal Party said, right now we are in an unprecedented crisis due to the COVID pandemic. We need political leaders to actually show up for work, roll up their sleeves, and do the job that they were elected to do and not worry about their own crass interests. That's what led to a motion of confidence in this government with unanimous support across all party lines, Mr. Speaker. That's the type of spirit we hope uh, we could see by our our federal uh, cousins uh, uh, in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. And at the same time, I would remind uh, all members, I know that there was a, an issue at the Liberal nomination meeting in Halton where uh, the uh, public health uh, measures were not followed, uh, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for London West. 
Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, last year the Premier and his government claimed that they would respect mayors and municipal councillors after attacking local democracy when they first got to office. A year ago, the Minister of Municipal Affairs said, and I quote, our government stands firm in its commitment to partnering with municipalities without pursuing a top-down approach. Speaker, yesterday we saw that commitment dissolve into mush when the Premier slipped a provision into a bill that would take away the option of ranked balloting from municipalities. Can the Premier tell us which municipalities asked for this assault on their local decision-making? The parliamentary assistant, member for. Thank Elba. you very much. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to say it's uh, my first opportunity to rise, and it's an honor as a PA to be able to answer a question in this house. Uh, I, want to, I want to thank the member opposite uh, for that question, Mr. Speaker. I can assure this house that we're committed to enhancing consistencies in election process. Our government believes that it is important that the way people vote in a federal and a provincial election is the same way that they vote in the municipal election. That's why earlier this year, Mr. Speaker, we responded to a request from the Chief Electoral Officer of Ontario and made changes to create a single voters list for both municipal and provincial elections, reducing the need to make correction on election day, shorten wait times, and save municipalities money, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, clearly not a single municipality asked for this change to be made. In London, where a historic and successful election was held with ranked ballots in 2018, councillors have denounced this interference. In the words of Councillor Morgan, allowing local communities to choose the way they elect their governments is a good thing for local democracy. A Kingston referendum saw 63 per cent support for ranked ballots in the 2022 municipal election. A Cambridge referendum referendum was supported by 56 per cent. The City of Toronto voted overwhelmingly in favour of ranked ballots for the 2026 elections. In fact, one of the only objections came from the Premier's nephew. We are in a pandemic, Speaker. Can the Premier explain why he felt it was so urgent to undermine local democracy Question. yet again and meddle in municipal politics? The member for Milton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we know that these changes would better respect taxpayers' dollars, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 443 out of the 444 municipalities, Mr. Speaker, voted using the first past the Pope system in 2018 election. The City of London was the only municipality in Ontario to have used the ranked ballot in Ontario, and their municipal election cost taxpayers, Mr. Speaker, an additional $515,000. That is 40 per cent more than what it cost them in the previous election, Mr. Speaker. And guess what, Mr. Speaker, they order. got the exact same— Okay. Member for Timmins, come to order. The Minister of Education, come to order. The Minister of Labour, come to order. The member for Milton, please wind up. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, and London got the exact same erection result that they would have under the first past the post system, Mr. Speaker, uh, used by the rest of Ontario. So the only thing this would do is bring consistency and save municipalities money, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Uh, speaker, I rise this morning to ask the Minister of Finance about the insanity that has become rampant in Ontario's uh, commercial insurance industry. I hear regularly from constituents about out-of-control premium increases being demanded by insurance companies and, in some instances, the outright refusal to renew contracts with condominium corporations that have had few or no claims. In the case of the Greenbrier community in Alliston, they saw modest annual rate increases in the period leading up to 2018. Then out of nowhere and with no claims, they were shocked to learn of their premium doubling to almost $16,000 in, uh, $16, in 2019. Incredibly, it doubled again in 2020 to almost $30,000. Now as a new year approaches, Greenbrier is looking at another potential doubling to $60,000, and that's if they can get the insurance at all. The story at the neighbouring Briar Hill condominium corporations is similar. Question. Speaker, most of these people are retired seniors, many on fixed incomes, 
In light of the near criminal behaviour of, crimin of commercial insurance companies, isn't it time that the Ontario government regulate this industry? Minister of Finance to reply. So, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Simcoe Gray uh, for raising this important matter. Uh, since we've been elected, as this legislature knows, we've been keeping a close watch on all aspects of insurance, whether it's automotive or the sort of uh, insurance that the member's talking about today. Uh, certainly since the beginning of this pandemic, our message has been clear to the insurance industry, which is that they need to understand their customers today will be their customers tomorrow. Ontarians expect no less than, than fair treatment from them. We are aware, in particular, of the difficult matters with regards to the condominium uh, corporation insurance, and I'd be happy to get more details from the member uh, specifically about those, about those issues. I have been actively meeting with effective consumers, with the insurance industry, with Brian Davies, who's the chair of FISRA, which is the regulator, um, and the government will continue to work and look for solutions, particularly as relates to the pressures related to, uh, to COVID-19, but to make sure that there is open insurance uh, for Ontarians in all situations. And the supplementary question. Thank you. And uh, back to the minister. Uh, just say I've written the minister three times in the last year, and I haven't received a response. My constituents are extremely uh, frustrated. Um, the industry says it's studying the problem. They make up the excuses that it's due to COVID-19 claims. Well, they haven't had COVID-19 claims yet. They uh, also say it's uh, uh, due to severe weather events. Well, I grew up uh, knowing about uh, Hurricane Hazel of 1954, and I don't think we've had anything like Hurricane Hazel since 1954, so I don't really accept their severe weather excuses. And I suggest the government get on the ball with respect to this, uh, this issue. It's across the province. It's not just Greenbrier or Briar Hill in, in my riding. It's not just the seniors that are affected. It's condominium corporations. It's turning into a crisis. People can't get insurance. They need insurance. And the excuses from the industry are unacceptable. So again, I ask the minister, what is the government going to do to protect these seniors and to protect these condominium corporations? Minister of Finance. Mr. Mr. Speaker, let me say, and I'll take as a given that we, if we did not reply to those letters uh, to the member, uh, we will. I'll take that up immediately when I get back. That's not acceptable. So my apologies for that, uh, Mr. Speaker. With regards to the issue, uh, the the initiatives that the Attorney General and my colleague, the Attorney General, introduced uh, have, are going to be helpful in terms of the civil liability components of this. It is one of the factors, but only one of the factors that's affecting the insurance industry. As I've said, we are working with the industry. We are working with the affected parties. We are working with. ISRA, which is the regulator, and as the member knows, uh, elements of conduct are currently are regulated by, by the government, not elements of price, uh, which are more specifically what he's referring to. But we'll continue to work with all the affected parties to make sure that insurance is available. I should note that there are 200 property and casualty insurers, which would be the kind of insurers that, uh, that would deal with this sort of matter, 19,000 insurance brokers, and one of the things that competitive market allows Response. is for individuals, corporations, seniors, businesses, to make sure that they're getting the best deal they can from a broadly based market. Thank you. Next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. After the Liberals' disastrous record of 600 school closures and an enormous repair backlog, our government is investing in our students and their learning environments. Yesterday, I was pleased to join the Minister and the Premier to announce funding for Loretto Abbey Secondary School in my riding of Eglinton Lawrence as part of our government's historic investment in new schools, additions, and child care spaces across the province. Can the Minister please outline what this funding will achieve, how it will help our students, and more importantly, will he commit to continuing to reverse the disastrous legacy of cuts and closures that marked the Liberals' time in office? Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Eglinton Lawrence for being an unapologetic defender for public education in the City of Toronto and across this province and for standing strongly to deliver a historic investment in a historic school older than Confederation, Loretto Abbey, a project that literally will help ensure a future generation of women continue to make a difference in our country. Mr. Speaker, under the former government for 15 consecutive years, the Liberals closed the most schools in provincial history. In sharp contrast, in the midst of a pandemic, the Premier of this province has allocated and invested 
$1 billion, an historic investment, to build 50 new schools, to renovate 23 major uh, school projects, and to expand 1,700 plus affordable childcare spaces for working parents. This is an investment in our future, in our children, and Response. we will continue to do whatever it takes to ensure our learning facilities are at the highest standard and state of the art. Supplementary, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, since 2018, I have been fighting to reverse the damaging impact of school closures and lack of investment in new schools across my riding of Carleton, because that was the legacy of the previous Liberal government. Shutting down Munster Elementary School was their legacy. And Minister, I have been working hard to secure funding for new schools in my riding. And yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I was thrilled to announce the approval of over $42 million for a brand new and the first secondary school in Riverside South. My question to the minister. Thank you. Thank you. My question to the minister is simple, Mr. Speaker. Will the minister commit to continue working on rebuilding an education system that was shamefully left in shambles Christian. by the previous Liberal government, and can he provide more detail on the new school coming to Riverside South? Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I am very grateful for the advocacy and the leadership of the member of Carleton, who has worked so hard to ensure the people of Riverside South and Carleton, finally, after a decade of adv advocacy being ignored by the former Liberal government, finally a government and a premier is delivering for this fast-growing suburban community, delivering a school, a $42 million investment, 1,500 size new high school that includes child care for working parents. But, Mr. Speaker, part of our broader lens is to ensure our learning facilities have the technology, have the accessibility, air conditioning, and all the necessities to ensure our kids are safe and learning in state of the art spaces. And, Mr. Speaker, it is why just yesterday the Premier, the member from Eglinton Lawrence, and I announced another $500 million investment, wow. a renewal in our schools, a sharp contrast to the devastating legacy of the former Liberals who really hurt suburban rural communities in this province. We Response. will continue to ensure that those communities get the voice, get the advocacy, and the investment they deserve. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Island. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. The government recently announced its so-called Keeping Ontario Safe plan and its six pillars, the first of which was the largest flu immunization campaign in the province's history, which unfortunately has already stumbled. Folks in every part of the province are being turned away because pharmacies don't have enough vaccines to meet the needs of taxpayers. How did the government go so terribly wrong on their first pillar? How can they ask Ontarians to do their part and get the vaccines and then force pharmacies to turn them away because of inadequate government preparations? Minister of Health to reply. Thank you. Well, the member is absolutely right in uh, the comment that this is an essential part of our Keeping Ontarians Safe plan to have the most effective flu campaign in Ontario's history to get as many vaccinations as possible. In fact, we ordered over 700,000 more doses this year than last year, and we have already shipped over 3.4 million doses of the flu vaccine across Ontario compared to last year at this time where we had shipped over 2.7 million. So we're already ahead of where we were last year. I would remind the member that this is something that happens every year because the shipments come in at different times from global manufacturers. There is no shortage of the flu vaccine. It is coming in on regular basis. We will receive shipments shortly. And I'm, I'm pleased that so many Ontarians are taking this seriously and want to have the flu vaccine. But please rest assured, everyone Response. in Ontario, if you want the flu vaccine, if you want the flu shot, there will be one ready for you. And the supplementary question. Speaker, in any other year, this rollout might have been acceptable, but it's not acceptable when this is the first pillar of the plan against the second wave of COVID. A constituent in Kingston, the Islands, Bruce Bursey, is in need of a high-dose vaccine, but has been told he will have to wait well into November to get one. It's not just him, and it's not just in Kingston. Flu season is here in Ontario, but the vaccines we need to slow it simply aren't. Will the government acknowledge that the rushed out use of an existing plan for its first pillar is because they simply didn't have a second wave strategy in place at the time? And will the government acknowledge they've already let Ontarians down on that first pillar 
and immediately move to acquire the vaccines and distribute them so that we can keep Ontarians safe. Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Speaker. And what I will say to the member is we have a very well-developed plan that was developed months ago to distribute the flu vaccine. We ordered 700,000 more doses this year than last year. They are being distributed according to the schedules that have been arranged with the global manufacturers and with the assistance of the federal government. We have no delays in shipment. They are proceeding as they were meant to be proceeded with. This happens every year where in some locations there are short-term situations where they may not have a, enough flu vaccines in, uh, in a particular pharmacy. I would suggest that your constituent may be able to find it somewhere else. But in any event, every pharmacy that is carrying the flu vaccine will have enough to make sure that every Ontarian that wants to have the flu shot will have the flu shot. The next question, the member for Scarborough. Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, your government introduced Bill, 1, Bill 218 under the cover of a COVID response bill, yet it would bar local municipal governments from using ranked ballot in their local elections. This omnibus legislation comes at a time when municipalities across Ontario are moving toward ranked ballots, and the Premier himself was chosen as his party's leader under this system. My question is who did the Premier consult with? Who asked for this provision? Why is it so urgent that it merits inclusion in a COVID response bill? Order. Did anyone actually ask for this to be done? Or is the Premier steamrolling once again over the independence of Ontario's local municipalities? The parliamentary assistant to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I find it a bit ironic uh, coming from the Liberal member. Mr. Speaker, may I remind the member about the promise that their federal leader made in terms of the election reform, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our proposed changes would bring predictability to municipal elections at a time when Ontarians are focused Order. on their health and safety. Make the electoral process consistent for across Gildwood, come municipal, to provincial and federal elections. A consistent municipal election process would also ensure municipalities avoid unnecessary higher costs associated with ranked ballots. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question. Speaker, this is not about unnecessary higher costs. Let me tell you the benefits of ranked ballot. Speaker, introducing this unrelated health, uh, this measure during a health crisis is unconscionable. It goes against the spirit of democracy. Ranked ballots produces fairer elections. The results reflect public opinions. They allow for Order. a diversity of voices to be represented in politics. They make democracy better. In the first municipality to use ranked ballots in Canada, London elected its first black woman as a city councillor. Ariel Kayabaga to this position. The system is having great success. The procedural fairness of ranked ballot tends to work against groups like this government who benefit from and perhaps prefer the status quo. Question. This government won a majority in an election with first past the post with just 40 percent of the popular vote. Speaker, how can the Premier justify overturning Order. democratically elected and deliberated decisions in Toronto, in Kingston, in Cambridge, in the City of London? Why are you Thank you. The supplementary. Sorry. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'd like to remind the member opposite that first post the pass system is a system that is used federally. It is a system that is used provincially, Mr. Speaker. And I am proud uh, to be in this legislature. And I think using the system, I don't think anybody can deny the representation in this legislature is very, very, very diverse. Mr. Speaker, you know, the member pointed out uh, in terms of the London being the city to use it. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to remind everyone in this legislature 
the costs associated with the system that was only used by the City of London. It cost the taxpayers of London $515,000 additional. That's 40 per cent higher, Mr. Speaker. Ultimately, they would Order. have gotten the exact same result using first-past-the-post system. So it would not have Order. made a difference, Mr. Speaker. We're bringing consistency right across this province. Order. The next question, the member for Flamborough, Glenville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. For nearly a decade, Ontario has hired educators based on seniority, and it has not served our students well, and in fact, it has undermined the quality of teaching throughout Ontario. Regulation 274 was first brought in by the former Liberal government, and it was and continues to be supported by the current opposition. Even the former Premier, who brought in this regulation, is on the record saying it was, quote, overcorrection. Speaker, can the Minister of Education please share with us why this egregious regulation needed to be removed? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this regressive regulation brought in by the former Liberal government has been relegated to history where it belongs after a decade, Speaker, of ensuring that hiring in this province is being given preference to seniority. It is this government and this Premier who took the decisive step to ensure that hiring and promotions reverts to a system of meritocracy. And I think that is profoundly in the interest of students and the interest of parents. And the question for the members opposite, for the, my colleagues, the Liberal Party and the Democrats, is will you stand with parents, with students, in saying that this regulation should never see the light of day? Though we have to defend the interests of students who demand quality learning now in this pandemic and every day thereafter. Mr. Speaker, we believe now more than ever, while children are facing the difficulties the learning loss and the struggle of the pandemic, we have to do everything Spons. we can to give our principals the speed and the latitude to hire quickly and hire the very best person for the job. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Minister, it's clear that an education system built around quality, diversity and innovation is one that benefits everyone involved. It's also clear that currently, our education system does not adequately reflect our province's rich diversity, in part due to previous hiring practices. Ontario is a beautiful mosaic of cultures and peoples, and this should be represented in our educational system. Speaker, can the minister please share with us how the revocation of Regulation 274 will better reflect our communities in our educational system? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. I think this, the member raises a very important point, which we have seen in boards across the province. You know, earlier, one of the remarks was that the status quo is indefensible, the concept that we should not sit here and defend a system that is not ensuring that merited people of diversity are in our schools. In Peel, where I commissioned and called for a review, the report was quite clear. In schools with 50 per cent racialized students, we have less than 25 per cent of racialized educators. How is that acceptable to any one of us? It is 2020. We need to ensure our communities reflect, that our educators reflect the communities in which they serve. Principals, school board associations, parents, students themselves have called for it. The only uh, audience, the only constituency calling for the status quo are our union partners, respectfully, and the members of the Liberal Party. And I think that is absolutely inconsistent Response. with the interests of quality, with the interests of our students. And you can counter the Premier to continue to ensure that we drive the reforms that ensure more equity, more diversity, more mobility for the next generation of educators in this province. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, tomorrow is Early Childhood Educator, ed Educator Appreciation Day, a way we can show appreciation for early childhood educators and the kids and the families they serve is by supporting the child care centers with stable, sustainable funding. Because whether it's ECEs or parents who will be counting on daycare spaces to be there when they go back to work or as they are going back to work, Ontarians need to know that affordable, high-quality, not-for-profit public daycare spaces will be there when they need them. But closures and low enrollment are taking their toll on centres, families, childcare workers and our economy. 
Can the Premier tell families how many childcare centres in Ontario are currently open and how many are closed? Thank you, Speaker. Uh, as of last week in this province, 95% of child care operators are opened, helping, supporting, working parents in the province of Ontario. 95% are open in this province because they have the guidance supported by the Chief Medical Officer of Health. They have the funding supported by the province and the feds, providing an historic investment. And not only that, Speaker, in the midst of this pandemic, the federal minister, Minister Ahmed Hussein, and I announced a one-year extension to provide stability of the federal-provincial child care agreement, early child care agreement, to ensure the sector knows with absolute clarity we will be there for them, as we have from the very early days of this pandemic, ensuring that they have the operating support while they had fewer children within their care. We are doing everything possible, recognizing, as the member has acknowledged, the importance of child care to get women and men back into the labour market. We are firmly committed to helping child care operators reopen, stay open, to support our economic recovery. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, any working family with young kids know how essential daycare is to ensuring parents, to ensuring parents can work and kids can get high-quality, affordable care. And that is why New Democrats have fought for licensed, high-quality, affordable, not-for-profit childcare for decades. This pandemic has thrown this into sharp relief. It's not just parents who know this is more essential now than ever. In September, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce highlighted the fact that a recovery will require ensuring child care can, and I quote, weather the pandemic. Now, so I ask again, how many spaces, not centres, how many spaces have closed since the pandemic, because we're hearing otherwise, and what will the minister do to reopen them? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Education. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, as the member will acknowledge, the, you know, the supply and demand of our childcare sectors is an important element that needs to be acknowledged. If there are fewer parents requesting the service, therefore there will be fewer children within childcare centres. And while we accept that parents, especially while they work from home, may have different arrangements and requirements uh, for the care of their children, Child care centres overwhelmingly, the critical mass, the vast majority, north of 94 per cent, roughly 95 per cent, have reopened. And why is it that they have done so? Because the government has provided them with funding each and every step of this pandemic. We just announced an additional $230 million infusion in our child care operators. But, Speaker, when it comes to the affordability of child care for the end user, for the parent, we introduced in this House a child care tax credit because after 15 years, respectfully, in the former government, we had the most expensive child care in Ontario, Response. and yet the opposition, when having an opportunity to support 200,000 working parents, they voted no. And I would hope that they will continue to reflect in the forthcoming budget about how we can make child care more affordable, more accessible for parents. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Today, there are 86 homes in Ontario in outbreak, seven with double-digit resident cases. Yesterday, The Globe reported that Ontario's testing backlogs are preventing long-term care homes from quickly identifying COVID-positive-19 residents, therefore increasing the risk of the spread of COVID-19 in the home. So, the last two days, it was 24,000 and 30,000 tests, well below our capacity, also with a backlog that was about the same as the tests that were done that day. So, those are the facts. So, a fast turnaround of tests is critical to preventing and managing outbreaks in long-term care homes. So, after seven months of being in this pandemic, why has the Minister of Long-Term Care failed to ensure, failed to prioritize testing for residents in long-term care homes? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I can uh, thank you very much for the question. I can certainly assure the member that we recognize how important testing is. That's why we're investing over a billion dollars in increasing our testing ability, our contact tracing, and following up with people who have been testing positive. We are placing a priority on our residents and staff in long-term care homes because those are the most vulnerable residents that need to be protected, as we do with hospitals and retirement homes and other places of congregate settings. But we also have to remember that testing is driven by the number of people who show up for tests. So the testing has gone down in the last few days because not as many people showed up for tests. That doesn't mean we can't test more. We are at the stage now where we can easily test more than 40,000 people per day. But if 40,000 
people don't show up to be tested, we test who's there. The important point is that anybody who wants to have a test will get a test and will get a timely response. Order. Order. Supplementary question. Fewer, thank you, Speaker. Fewer people are getting tests, but we have the same kind of backlog. That doesn't sound right to me, but I'll let the minister maybe explain that to me. So yesterday in a late show, the member from Eglinton Lawrence, in response to a question, similar question, made it sound like in Ottawa there were zero resident cases, that everything was okay. What she failed to mention was, in the minister's own backyard at Ottawa's West End Villa, we did have a case where there were double-digit cases. They're just not there anymore. 20 residents died. 20 families. I could barely contain my anger. And now in Hawkesbury, there's 31 residents, double digit. And we all know what's going to happen. The minister knows what's going to happen. So, what is the minister going to do to ensure we have the testing? to prevent the spread of COVID-19 amongst residents in Ontario's long-term care homes. Mr. Bell. Thank you very much, Speaker. I think it, it's very important to set the record straight here. There is no backlog in testing. There had been for a period of time, but it is caught up. When you hear about a backlog of 25,000 tests, that's not a backlog. We can test those people the very next day. There is not a delay of two or three or four days in testing. We can test that number easily and more. So any suggestion that any outbreaks in long-term care homes are directly related to a backlog in testing is simply not true. We are catch, caught up with our testing. We are able to test the people within a reasonable period of time. In fact, the vast majority of our cases are turned around within 24 to 48 hours. So there are no backlogs in testing right now. We are testing everyone who comes in a timely Response. manner. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton East. My question is to the Premier. When is he going to start, and he and the Conservative government going to start taking Brampton's health care crisis seriously. The Conservative government has chosen to ignore the fact that Brampton is one of Canada's fastest growing cities. It is a city of over 600,000 people, yet we only have one single hospital. We have a continued shortage of beds. We only have two COVID testing centres. This is what a health care crisis look like, looks like. It was made bad under the, cons the past Liberal government and is being made worse under the cons current Conservative government. We don't want Conservatives and Liberals to come around every year during an election just to have them continue to underfund our health care system. When will the Premier and this Conservative government start taking Brampton's health care crisis seriously? Mr. Hill. Well, I would say to the member opposite that there are many parts of Ontario that don't have the new hospital that Brampton is asking for. In fact, probably almost every one of you in this chamber wants to have a new hospital in their area. There is a way that sure. these determinations are made based on need, based on the condition of the existing hospitals. But any suggestion that the spread of, of COVID in uh, Brampton and Appeal regions is because you don't have a new hospital is ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. However, we are cognizant of the needs in Brampton, as we are cognizant of the needs across Ontario. And we are working in Peel and Ottawa and Toronto to make sure that there are uh, significant assessment centres available, whether it's through the existing centres, whether it's through pharmacies in some areas where there are significant needs. We're also providing pop-up centres and mobile testing centres. So we are addressing the needs of the people in Brampton and Peel region as we are addressing the needs of people across the province. And the supplementary. If the Conservative government is so confident in their handling of Brampton's health care, then why are they allowing patients in the one hospital that Brampton has to be kicked out during a pandemic? Right now in Brampton, families of patients in Brampton Civic Hospital's complex continuing care unit are being told that their loved ones need to leave to make room for COVID-19 patients. I spoke with these families. 
The patients in this unit are often nonverbal, they're immobile, they're being victimized by an underfunded health care system in Brampton and are now being kicked out as their continuing care unit is being shut down. With no clear answers from this government, they have written to the Premier with no response. Will the Premier stop underfunding Brampton's health care system and give these families and all families in Brampton the health, the health care funding that we deserve? Uh, thank you, Speaker. Again, uh, it's important to understand the facts in the situation. No one who is in a hospital that needs to be in a hospital is going to be kicked out. We are making sure that we are expanding our capacity uh, in Brampton and Peel region and across the province for an increase in COVID-19 patients, for an increase in patients who may come to the hospital because of flu, and to be able to continue to do the surgeries and procedures that had to be postponed during wave one. We are making that capacity. We are not kicking anyone out of a hospital that needs to be there. What we are doing is increasing capacity so that as we more and more people are admitted to surgery and are admitted to hospital because of COVID-19, because we know that's happening, that we will have the facilities available for anyone who needs to be in hospital. A member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. In May of this year, over five months ago, I asked the government to cap Food Delivery Service Commission fees at 15 per cent to help restaurant owners during government-imposed restrictions that have forced them to rely entirely on takeout orders for their operation and survival. Other jurisdictions have already capped these commission fees at 15 per cent, and they did so months ago. Our restaurants need our support, and they need it now. Real support, Mr. Speaker, not photo ops of MPPs ordering takeout or the Premier asking delivery companies to please, please, please reduce their fees. Will the Premier finally do the right thing and cap food delivery commission fees at 15 per cent during these restrictions, yes or no? Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for her question and, and appreciate, as I said yesterday, all the suggestions that we can get, including this one. She notes, as you did, that the Premier did, from the podium, uh, with some effect, uh, suggest that these, these companies reduce their fees, and in fact, some did as a result. But, Mr. Speaker, we have a broader-based approach uh, to supporting our restaurants, to supporting our small businesses. The Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction uh, introduced a program, $60 million, Mr. Speaker, to support the purchase of PPE, $1,000 per uh, per uh, per business of course in affected areas mr speaker we've introduced a program 300 million dollars to cover electricity bills and other bills and mr speaker i do think that uh, the member may call them photo ops but but that it is important as well that we send the message uh, through our actions as well as through our words that we should all be supporting local restaurants whether it's by takeout in the areas that are affected and no longer have in-room dining or Response. in the other areas of the province by enjoying a good meal with your favorite in your favorite restaurant thank you Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, the minister for his answer. Mr. Speaker, back uh, to the Premier. We're now well into the second wave of this pandemic, and still the government is slow to respond. Delays in decision-making, coupled with contradictory and confusing messaging from this government, is costing people and businesses big time. The recent lockdowns in Toronto, Peel and Ottawa came into effect the night the announcement was made, costing restaurants tens of thousands of dollars worth of food and labour. There was absolutely no time to, for businesses to prepare whatsoever. Zero. It was one thing to scramble in the spring when this was new, but now, eight, uh, seven months in, completely unacceptable. When will this government start respecting small business owners and give them at least some notice to ensure they can prepare, organize, and mitigate loss? Their survival depends on it. Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, I, I don't see how the, the members of the Liberal Party can simultaneously be saying this government needs to follow public health advice and then criticize the government when it follows public health advice. We've always said that we will make, take the steps that are necessary to make sure that the health and safety of Ontarians are regarded, and we will do that in a way that balances economic interests. That's why, with the recent announcement with regards to York Region, some additional time was allowed, and I think that was, that was an important modification. But Mr. Speaker, some other things that we've allowed are uh, very popular, and in fact, the leader of the, uh, the member's party suggested the delivery of alcohol, uh, support for patios, 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, there are many, many measures, and we will continue to take those measures to support our small businesses. And I'll look to the members across the aisle to support those measures when this government brings forward in our upcoming budget and when we bring them forward otherwise. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. My question is for the Premier. Last week, a court decision fined South Lake Regional Health Centre $100,000 after the hospital pleaded guilty to two of seven charges under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. The hospital did not keep their workers safe, and now a registered nurse has had her life change forever. According to the Ontario Nurses Association, this is one of many acts of violence that have resulted in devastating injury for staff at South Lake. Does the minister feel that the system worked, that the two charges against the South Lake Hospital will result in safer workplace for healthcare workers? The Minister of Labour. Well, thank you very much, and I uh, thank the member opposite uh, for this question. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Speaker, let me begin by uh, thanking all of those healthcare workers uh, across this province. Uh, who have been fighting uh, every single day to protect uh, families and communities uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, furthermore, I also uh, extend our condolences to any worker who's been uh, injured uh, on the job who've, or who have uh, suffered uh, violence or harassment uh, in the workplace. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the laws are crystal clear uh, in this province, and uh, as a government, we will not tolerate uh, any violence, any harassment uh, in the workplace, and one uh, injury is one too many for me as minister. The supplementary question. Speaker, the minister has to connect the dots on this issue. Union, professional association representing nurses, and other frontline healthcare workers have been ringing the alarm bells for years. SEIU was here last year trying to get the government to pay attention to those horrific events. Speaker, did you know 80% of all nurses will be assaulted at work during their career? 80%. Violence against nurses have been normalized in our hospital and our long-term care home, while this government, this Minister of Labour, this Minister of Health, and this Premier do nothing. Minister, what concrete action will you take to keep health care workers safe? Mr. Labour. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The health and safety of every single worker uh, in this province is our top priority. Mr. Speaker, that's why during the pandemic, uh, our Ministry of Labour inspectors have done nearly 24,000 uh, investigations uh, since the beginning of March related uh, to COVID-19. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've uh, issued over 22,000 orders to uh, improve work sites and job sites uh, across the province uh, to protect uh, uh, all workers in uh, every type of business. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, during the pandemic since March, we've actually shut down uh, nearly 40 uh, workplaces, again, to protect the health and safety uh, of every worker. And I'm uh, extremely proud uh, that I was able to join uh, the Premier just two weeks ago to announce that our government is moving forward with hiring nearly Response. 100 new Ministry of Labour Training and Skills Development inspectors. And uh, I'm also proud to say, Mr. Speaker, that that will be a record number of labour inspectors in Ontario's history. That concludes the time for question period this morning. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.